In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at one-sided limits. So let's take a look at this question here. We want to find what is the limit as x goes to 3 of f at x. Now, we have a problem here that wasn't in the previous questions we looked at. As I approach 3 from the left-hand side, you can see that my function is approaching 4. However, as I approach 3 from the right-hand side, we see that my function is approaching the value of 7. So because of this jump or break in the graph, we have here a point of discontinuity. So this function is not continuous. So evaluating the limit at 3 becomes a question. So to answer that question, what we have to do is take a look at what's called one-sided limits. So if I want to express or ask what is the limit as I approach 3 from the left, what we're going to do is notationally we're going to write the limit as x approaches 3, and we're going to put a superscript of a minus sign there for the function f at x. And this tells the person reading it that now we're approaching 3 from the left-hand side. As I approach 3 from the left-hand side, as we discussed here, your function is approaching 4. And notice here, if I take the limit, as I approach 3, I'm going to put a superscript of plus. That'll signify I'm now approaching 3 from the right-hand side. As I approach 3 from the right-hand side, my function, f at x, is approaching 7. So now we have some new notation here. Again, you have the limit from the left, illustrated by the 3 superscript minus sign, is a limit from the left-hand side. And likewise, with the superscript of 3 plus, we have the limit from the right-hand side. So what does this mean when the limit from the left and right do not equal? If you go to take the limit of a particular number from the right-hand side, and that's not equal to the same as a limit as you take from the left-hand side, what we have here is at that value, so in this case here at a, that function, that limit I should say, does not exist. However, if you go to take the limit from the left and right, and they actually do equate, so the limit from the left and limit from the right are equal to some value l, then you would say that that limit exists and is equal to l in this case. So going back to the previous example here, you'll notice that the limit from the left and right were not equal. So this limit does not exist. Let's take a look at some examples. All right, let's take a look at these, this question here. We got this graph here, this graph f at x here. And uh, what we want to find is, let's take a look at a. They want us to find the limit as x goes to 1, if it exists. So if I'm going to answer this problem, I want to take the limit as x goes to 1. Well, as I approach 1 from the right, and as I approach 1 from the left, notice we're in either case we're approaching the same value, and that value is going to be, going to be a 3 here. So therefore the limit as x goes to 1 of f at x is 3. All right, let's take a look at the limit as I approach 3 from the left. As I approach 3 from the left-hand side, my function is approaching 2. So the limit of f at x as x approaches 3 from the left is 2. Let's try another. Now what's the limit as I approach 3 from the right? As I approach 3 from the right-hand side, I can see that my function is approaching negative 2. I'm going to go on to d here. So therefore, if they want me to find the limit as x approaches 3, as I approach it from the left and right, we're getting two different values. So this limit does not exist. Let's try e. They want me to evaluate the function at 3. Well, f at 3 is equal to, if you notice here, f at 3 is going to be equal to 1. And to keep in mind, as you approach 3 from the left, or you approach 3 from the right, you're never at 3. And because of that reason, your function as I approach it from the left is approaching 2, and the, as I approach 3 from the right-hand side, I'm approaching negative 2. But at 3, right on 3, the function is at 1. All right, let's try f. Now what happens here as I approach negative 2 from the left? As I approach negative 2 from the left, I can see that my function is approaching a value of one, negative 1. As I approach negative 2 from the right-hand side, I can see that my function is approaching negative 1 again. Let's take a look at h. Now they want us to determine what is the limit as x goes to negative 2 of f at x. Well, in this case here, we can see that as I approach it from the left, 
or I approach it from the right, we're getting the same value. So the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function is negative 1. And lastly, quick observation here, f at negative 2 is actually all the way down here and is equal to negative 3. All right, let's try some more. Just a quick recall here, recall that the absolute value function is defined as a piecewise function. And how the absolute value function works is when x is greater than or equal to 0, it just outputs itself. And when x is negative, it multiplies it by a minus sign to make it positive. So when you go to graph your absolute value function here, you end up getting when x is positive, it's essentially the line y equals x. Right, because it'll be completely unchanged. However, when x is negative, normally it would be output in this direction. But because in this area here, my function is negative, we multiply it by a minus sign, and then you're going to be going out like this. So just as a reminder, this is what the absolute value of x function looks like. All right, let's see how we can use the absolute value function in some questions. So for this first question here, they want you to evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 of the absolute value of x. Well, again, if you remember from our graph here, we have to examine what happens as I approach 0 from the left and right. Because recall that this limit only exists if as I approach it from the left and right, we get the same value. The limit as I approach 0 from the left-hand side of the absolute value of x is what? Well. As I approach 0 from the left-hand side, we will be inputting negative values. So now, if, as I input negative values, the absolute value of x becomes negative x. And if I go to evaluate this limit, as I'm approaching 0 from the left-hand side, I can see that my function itself is approaching 0. Now, in the other case, if I take the limit as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side of the absolute value of x, I can see here that... Um, as I approach it from the right-hand side, my values would be positive, in which case I can drop the absolute value. And again, as I approach 0 from the right-hand side, my function itself is also approaching 0. So therefore, the limit from the left and right are equal, and therefore the limit as x approaches 0 exists and is equal to 0. Let's try another. So in this question here, we want to show that uh, this limit actually does not exist. So let's take a look at applying this without actually doing the graph here. Let's try to do this just from our definition. Well, recall here, I know that the absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to 0, and it's equal to negative x if x is less than 0. So therefore, what's the limit as I approach 0 from the left of this expression? We will be inputting negative values, in which case this will be negative x over x, and we get the limit as x goes to 0 from the left as I approach 0 from the left-hand side, we would have a non-zero number at the top and bottom that are the same, and those would cancel off, and this would be negative 1, and then my limit would be negative 1 here. Let's try it the other way. If I take the limit as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side of this expression, now I'm inputting values that are greater than 0, so they're positive values, in which case I can drop the absolute value, and this becomes x over x. And now again, those x's will cancel. And the reason for that is they're non-zero values, both the same. And in which case, we get 1 here. So you can see here, as I approach 0 from the left-hand side, and I, as I approach this function f at x from the right-hand side of 0, I get different values, negative 1 and 1. So because of that, the limit does not exist. All right, let's try another. Okay, so for this function here, they want us to take a look and evaluate the limit as I approach 1 from the right and left. Well, as I approach 1 from the right-hand side, what happens here? You'll notice in the bottom here, as I approach 1 from the right-hand side, here, take a look at a number line here, let's say you're at 1. If I'm approaching 1 from the right-hand side, you're looking at numbers 0 0.001 maybe. So you can see here that if I were to put this in the absolute value of x minus 1 expression, the denominator, that value would always be positive. Any values coming from the right of 1, the x minus 1 would be positive. And because of that, we can drop the absolute value sign. This becomes x minus 1. 
in which case we're taking the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, I can go ahead and do difference of squares on the top with the x minus 1 on the bottom. Because I'm approaching 1 from the right-hand side, we have two non-zero factors that cancel off. And we end up getting the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of x plus 1, which is going to equal 2. Likewise, if I were to approach 1 from the left-hand side now, we'd be having numbers like 0.999. Well, take your limit here. As I approach 1 from the left of x squared minus 1, the denominator this time, as I input values of 0.999, or anything to the left of 1, any values to the left of 1, input it into this denominator will be negative, which means that I can drop the absolute value sign, but I'm going to have to multiply that by a minus 1 out in front. And this becomes a limit as x goes to 1 from the left of x minus 1 times x plus 1 over negative x minus 1, in which case these will cancel. And I end up getting the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of negative x plus 1. Subbing that in here, we end up getting negative 1 plus 1. And this is going to equal negative 2. If you notice here now, the limit from the right and the limit from the left are not equal. And because of that, the limit as I approach 1 what does not exist. The limit from the right and left are not equal, and because of that, limit does not exist. Let's take a look at another problem. So for this question here, they want you to find the value of k such that the following expression exists. So in this case here, for this expression to exist, what has to happen is the limit from the left and right as I approach negative 2 must equal. First step here is let's take a look. If I take the limit as I approach negative 2 from the right hand, right hand side, let's say. I'm going to write this down here. This is 3x squared plus kx plus k plus 3. And then I can go ahead and factor the bottom. The bottom factors into x plus 2, x minus 1. Notice in the top and bottom are polynomials. So I can take the limit of the top and limit of the bottom separately. As I do that here, um, you can, if the top is in fact a polynomial, I can input that minus 2 for the values of x here. And I can do the same for the denominator. Now, what ends up happening here, as you can see, so notice here when I input that, I end up dividing by 0. So what I need to happen is I need to get a 0 in the top. Because if I have a 0 in the top, that means that I have a factor of x plus 2 in the bottom, which I know I do. And if I have a, a 0 in the numerator, that must also mean I have a factor of x plus 2 in the numerator, as that would be the only way the polynomial would have a root at negative 2. Right? A polynomial has a root at minus 2, provided that x plus 2 is a factor. So therefore, we know x plus 2 is a factor in the denominator. I need an x plus 2 in the numerator. And the only way that can happen is if negative 2 is a root. Negative 2 is a root of this polynomial if it's equal to 0. So we're going to set this equal to 0, in which case here we get 12 minus k plus 3 is 0. And you end up getting here k is 15. So therefore, if k is 15, this expression will have a factor of x plus 2 in the top and bottom. Let's see what happens. So we end up getting k equals 15 here. So that means that this polynomial up in the top, the k value is 15, so that I can get a factor of x plus 2 in here. Let's take a look at what that would look like. If I substitute in a 15 for k, 3x squared plus 15x plus 18, and we can factor that 3 out, we get x squared plus 5x plus 6, and lastly, that factors into x plus 3, x plus 2. Now notice, as I approach negative 2 from the right-hand side, these two values will cancel off as they're non-zero. Now I take the limit as I approach negative 2 from the right of this expression. And now this is polynomial over polynomial. We can go ahead and sub that in, in the numerator. And in the denominator, we end up getting 3 times 1 over negative 3 is negative 1. And that's the limit as I approach negative 2 from the right-hand side. But again, if you recall, taking a look at this expression here, the reduced expression, this is a rational function. The top is a polynomial, the bottom is a polynomial, and 
the polynomial on the bottom at the value negative 2 is non-zero. So because of that, this is continuous at this value. And since it's continuous at this value, you're going to get the exact same number as I approach, take the limit as I approach negative 2 from the left of this expression, you will also get minus 1. So therefore, the limit from left and right are equal, and they're equal to minus 1. And therefore, the value of k that ensures that the limit of this expression exists is 15. Okay, that concludes one-sided limits. Please review these concepts here. Uh, Re-go re through some of them. Try them out on your own. Make sure you have a decent idea of how the absolute value function is working here as well. That was an important part of the lesson. Um, take a look at this example here. Rewatch it if need be. Try to go through them yourselves. Thank you.